Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live right here on Giants.com and the Giants mobile app. Schmelk, Sytac with you. The phone number, 201-939-4513. Also, it's all brought to you by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football Giants. All right, we've done a bunch of combine stuff for a couple straight days. Uh, Matt will give his quick take on that today, and then we are going to do a deep, deep, deep dive into free agency. Uh, it might go a little long, folks. I'll apologize ahead of time, but we will get to your calls as soon as we possibly can. Mr. Sytac, how are you, sir? I'm good. How are you doing? How I'm was, great. How was Indy? It was fun. It was one of my favorite weeks of the year. Get to talk to a lot of people, learn a lot of stuff, see these guys up close, get body types. Fantastic week. Loved it. The cocktail sauce at St. Elmo's still is like I remember. I'll tell you, they juiced it up this year. Ooh, wow. I, remind me when the show is over. Pearson, or who usually produces, he's off this week. He did his first dabble in the cocktail sauce this year. I have a video. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah. And it wasn't just him. The next day, I was with Art Stapleton, and he took a bite, and he almost, like, keeled over. Yeah, so I'm going to have to see that video of Pearson. <laughs> they, they, pumped up, they pumped up the spiciness this year. Right. It, it was pretty good. Looking right. forward to it next year. Before Yes. Before we do for agency, uh, give me your quick take on, on the combine. Yeah, so there were three things that really, I guess, stood out to me. And apologies if you, this was spoken about the last couple of days. Uh, first, just quick hat tip to Xavier Worthy for setting the new 40 record. Very impressive. Kind of fast. It was fine. <laughs> Pretty fast. And he could also run routes. He's yeah. an interesting nice. prospect. Player. Second thing, and this is what I actually wrote about on yesterday for yesterday's Cover 4, which is up on Giants.com, which was I thought the two players that might have helped themselves the most, maybe not the most, but helped themselves greatly, J.J. McCarthy and Michael Penix. I mean, J.J. McCarthy, we'll see where he actually ends up going in the draft, but there's buzz now that he could go as high as the fourth pick with the team trading up to Arizona at four in order to get McCarthy there. I'm not sure if that was so much himself helping himself at the combine or the media catching up with what front offices were already thinking. Yeah, that that could be true. It's just the buzz that came out of Indy no, was no that 100%. he didn't do anything to hurt himself at while in Indy. He, you know, apparently interviewed well from the reports that i've seen through pretty well yep so he helped himself and same goes for michael Penix. but i think the biggest thing for him and ian rapaport tweeted this towards the beginning of last week was that he cleared all of the medicals where it got to a point where rapaport tweeted there's zero concern at all about his previous injuries he has an extensive injury history so again just something that i thought was was interesting from the week in indy We'll see if, you know, between the medicals and his throwing, if that can push Penix into first round or if he's more of a day two, second round pick. Only time will tell. And the very last thing that stood out to me was, and I'm sure I'm sure you've seen this. This went viral. Rome Adunze. What he was the last person on the field during the wide receiver drills when the wide receivers were out there running drills. Everyone else was gone and in, going into the locker room. And he stayed out on the field because he was determined to get a 6-6 on, I believe it was the three-cone drill. Without knocking that third cone down. <laughs> yeah. And he just, I don't know how many times he tried it, but he was the last person out on the field. I think it was eight, I heard. I think he tried it eight times. Yeah. So, I mean, that just shows perseverance. Yeah. Not willing to give up, trying to fight for, you know, something he wants to accomplish. And considering he's a prospect that a lot of people, you know, around – NFL media world believes the Giants could be interested in at number six. I just found that very interesting and something to me that I found to be very appealing in a prospect. Coaches are going to fall in love with that guy uh, from the size to the checking all the athleticism boxes. That, but everything you hear about him is a personality in terms of his approach and all that sort of stuff and how he's going to meet with teams. He's going to be a guy that coaches are going to have to make a decision. Well, do we like Odunze and the intangibles? And again, Malik Neighbors might be great off the field, too. We just didn't. He left really quickly after the media part, so we didn't have a chance to really see him do a ton in Indianapolis. And I think that's going to be kind of uh, the debate. All right. Franchise tags first. The Giants did not use any of their tags on either Xavier McKinney or Saquon Barkley. Some players were tagged. I'll run through the list for everybody real quick just so you have them. Uh, Josh Allen, Brian Burns, T. Higgins, Cornerback Jalen Johnson, defensive tackle Justin Matabique, Michael Pittman, wide receiver Colts, Legarius Sneed, cornerback Chiefs, and Antoine Winfield, safety Bucks, all got the ex non exclusive franchise tag. Notice these guys are literally all the guys at the top of their position groups. 
on yes. in the free agency chart. So these guys are are guys that are going to get top of the market values. They all got franchise. Kyle Duggar got the transition tag from the Patriots. And here's what I'll say about Saquon and Xavier McKinney not getting tagged. I know a lot of fans, some fans are upset about it. Some fans understand. I'll just give my point of view on it. I don't know what the Giants thinking is, is on this. But we've talked to Joe Shane a lot, and he's always stressed the importance of positional value, Matt. And, you know, you take a look at where the running back and safety markets are. It's probably, in terms of the franchise tag at least, it's the lowest number you have in terms of the position groups. So, for me, I think... If you look at the tags, what they would have been for those two guys, you're looking at anywhere from, I think it's 25 million combined. It was 13 for McKinney, right? Give or take, that was the transition for, for the him, transition, I think, yeah. and more for the franchise. And I then, think the franchise would have been 17. Yeah, which which I don't think they would have went there. That, no, that, that's a lot of money. And then 12 for Saquon if they would have tagged him a second time. So that's 25 million dollars. I could take that 25 million dollars and find four starters, and maybe even more important positions. So. Remember, it's not just you don't have those guys. Well, then now you have the money you would have spent on those guys to spend elsewhere. And that doesn't mean one of those two guys might not be back next week when they go to the market and come back and they sign for a contract and you can get the cap number down a little bit to manage it a little bit easier. That's very possible. But I just think there's ways to spread that money around without locking up that type of money for one year. And you can say, well, you tag them with the intention of extending them. Well, what happens if you can't come to a deal? Like last year with Saquon. Bingo. Then you're stuck. And, yeah, the Giants have a lot of cap space. The cap went up, you know, 30, 40 million, depending on what number you want to use. That's a lot of that cap space if those two guys are tagged, right? So, I know you can't tag both of them. I get that. But I just think when you take a look at it, it gives them a lot more flexibility to spend that money where they want in free agency rather than getting it locked into two guys at two positions that are not considered premium positions. Yeah, and you also, you brought up, you know, the Saquon situation last year. The Giants, in a sense, kind of got lucky that Saquon showed up on the first day of training camp. Yeah. They had that restructured one-year deal. He signed it and was there for the first day of training camp. He could have held out until right before week one. I mean, we Josh Jacobs was the same situation as Saquon, and he didn't sign and report to camp for a month after Saquon. Chris Jones didn't play in the first game of the year. Exactly. So the Giants, in that sense, sort of got lucky that Saquon was, you know, a team player and willing to come back for the first day of camp so that this wouldn't be hanging over them as they begun practices. Uh, that, was, that was big. And another thing that I saw that I believe, I want to say one of the beats uh, put it out on Twitter this morning or last night, and it's something that I feel like a lot of people maybe don't realize when it comes to these tags, but the players are pretty open about not liking getting the tag. They would obviously rather hit the open market, seek whatever deal they want with whatever teams. I feel like that's pretty public knowledge. Sure. A lot of these players also share the same agents. So, you know, the Giants, in the sense, could do right by, by one of a player, let's just say Xavier McKinney, by not putting on the, the tag on him, which is, I'm assuming, what McKinney would have preferred. And in that sense, his agent, who represents other players, I'm not saying he's going to, like, cut the Giants slack when it comes to a deal with another player, but I think he's going to think a little more, you know, positively towards the Giants, towards Joe Shane, and when he goes into negotiations with the, for these other players, he's going to remember what the Giants did for his other guy, thinking like, oh, they do right. They try to do right by the players. It's just a small part of this whole process, but is one that I feel like gets greatly overlooked by almost everyone. But it is important. Yeah, I'd say that's a benefit of it. I, that's obviously not the driving force. Of course. If the Giants of thought it was in the best interest to tag him, they would have tagged both of these guys. But 100%. that is a benefit, you're right, of not tagging him. You do get, and I think the players appreciate that too, to an extent. But again, not, not that that's the goal. It's just a benefit of making those decisions. So uh, let's go quickly through these position groups, um, Matt. And I think when I took a look at the groups the last couple of days trying to get ready for today's show... <clears throat> I was impressed at the depth at a couple different spots. One is edge. There's a lot of good edge players in this class, man. And it's broken up into categories, I think. If you want to get into that $20 million, 17 to $20 million a year category, Daniel Hunter or Bryce Huff. Daniel Hunter's 29. Obviously has experience with Andre Patterson, the Giants defensive line coach from his time in Minnesota. Really good player. Bryce Huff, only 25 Kind of a designated pass rusher. Not really great against the run in his time with the Jets. But, boy, he when he passes the passer, he's really good. Saw so last year. he's a guy that will be a little bit cheaper 
um, than Hunter, but still probably over that $15 million a year mark if you go by some of the projected contracts that Pro Football Focus has. Then you want to get to the little level below that, right? You got the Jonathan Greenerts, who I think will probably be around, you know, maybe 10 to $12 million a year, something yeah. like that. And then if you want to, you know, Dorrance Armstrong is a guy that's been good as with the Cowboys as a as a rotational pass rusher. Uh, Josh Uche from the Patriots is a guy that I think you could get on the cheap as a third down pass rusher. He's really one of those undersized guys that you could put out there on passing downs. Andrew Van Ginkle, a guy if you watched Hard Knocks in season with the Dolphins this year, was featured prominently. He had a really nice year with the Dolphins again, a smaller guy. AJ Epinesa, it's a guy that Joe Shane and Ryan Dable are familiar with from their time in Buffalo. He's hitting free agency, kind of more of a power guy. Then you have guys you can kind of have flyers on, right? Carl Lawson's dealt with injuries. He a free agent. You could probably get him on a cheap one-year deal. Marcus Davenport, who's a very effective young pass rusher, hurt all year last year, has dealt with injuries. That's a guy you can take a flyer on. Derek Barnett, someone Giant fans are familiar with from the Eagles, another younger guy. These guys are just 26, 27 years old. And again, he didn't he got cut mid-year, didn't sign with somebody until mid-year last year. Barnett ended up finishing the year fairly strong, but he's a guy you could probably get on a pretty cheap one-year deal. So look at all those guys I just listed. There's a lot of options at edge, and I think Joe Shane made it pretty clear at the Combine talking to the media that adding pass rush is a huge priority this offseason. Yeah, and I mean, you just went through a long list of some very talented players, and you didn't even touch on everyone. I didn't. I mean... Wouldn't it be a f- kind of full circle moment if the Giants brought in Chase Young after <laughs> everything that happened? I worry about his <laughs> medicals, but yes, he's a good player. Well, just to put it out, he's you know another free agent. Yep. Zadarius Smith, obviously on the older side, but still a you know talented veteran. Well, he's been one of the most consistent pass rushers in the league the last couple yeah. of years. Jadavi, Jadavian Clowney, mm-hmm. and one of my favorites, and a guy that I feel like there have been rumored interest from the Giants for years. Let me guess, Leonard Floyd. Leonard Floyd. <laughs> You got it. The rumor that won't go away. Seriously. I mean, since, <laughs> the, what was it, the 2017 draft? Yeah, it's a long time. There, I feel like every other year there's been a rumor of the Giants having interest in Leonard Floyd. How but, about he's 31 already? I couldn't believe it when I saw I he was that. 31 already. It seems like he just came out, right? That's crazy. crazy. But even at 31, I mean, he had, I believe, nine and a half or ten sacks last year. He's had around ten sacks the last couple of seasons. Still a very, very talented guy. And, again, wasn't even mentioned on your list of guys. Yeah. That just goes to show how deep this position is in free agency this year. The Giants have a chance. If they decide they want to address the edge position in free agency, they have an opportunity to add a very talented player to the rotation of Kayvon Thibodeau, Aziz Ojolari. But that's the problem. It's a, right now it's a two-man rotation. Yes. There's nobody else on the roster. John Ward's a free agent. I guess Taman Fox is still in the building, right? But I, I, th- I, I, think, believe, I, I believe he's is. on a reserve futures deal, right? Yeah. But there's just not a lot of bodies out there. No, right now. I mean, they're so, going to need to add bodies to the to that group. 100%. So I imagine they'll be active in, in at some level with those guys, and I could be convinced on a lot of them, um, to be honest with you. So that's interesting. Looking at the defensive— oh, before you, Sorry, yes, before please. you go back, just one other guy, Danico Autry. Yeah, he's just because he's experienced with with our new defensive I'm coordinator from the Titans. Four by the time the season starts. I don't know if that would be you know the big edge signing, but right. if they want to just try to add some depth to the group, as we said, they need more than just one more player added to the group. That's just someone I think potentially keep an eye out. If you can get him on the right deal, I think yeah. that's fair. But yes. he was an effective player in Tennessee. I just didn't list him because of the age. Yeah, thirty three is that's long fair. in the tooth. But agreed, I think that's a good connection to make. I'm with you on that. Defensive tackle uh, Christian Wilkins surprisingly did not get franchised by the Miami Dolphins. He's at the top of the market. Uh, to me, that's going to be too pricey. I can't spend twenty. But he's going to make twenty to twenty-five million. I can't yeah. do that for another defensive so. tackle. Yeah, they're really good player. Leonard Williams is probably going to get more than fifteen million a year again. I don't think I'd go back down that road, but you could. I know they liked him here. He's a good player. You never know. Never say never. And he, he's only twenty-nine. <laughs> You know, we talk about Leonard Floyd shocked he's 31. I feel like Leonard Williams has been in the league for 10 years. Feels he's only like he's 29 been years old. Forever. I, I think he got drafted when he was 20. I think he was one of those guys that got drafted yeah, very young. I think you're right. But he's only 29 years old. So um, Sheldon Rankins, I think, is an interesting one. He's only 29. He's that kind of three technique. Uh, Tyre Tart. Two other guys I'll mention. Tyre Tart, former Titan. Mm-hmm. The problem is that he was cut by the Titans last year, late in the year. He had a really good year two years ago. Clearly, he didn't come to terms on a contract so I think that was an issue but he got cut by Tennessee so I don't know what Shane Bowen thinks of him after having a rough year with the Titans last year but someone to keep an eye on and then the other guy I'll mention is Daquan Jones 
who was having a yep. really good year for the Bills last year. Obviously, there's familiarity there with, with, with Joe Shane and Brian Dable to an extent. 32, a little bit older. But if you don't have to pay a lot for him as a situational three-technique pass rusher, he was having an excellent year last year. I think he got hurt the week before the Giants played the Bills, actually. I think it was right before the Giants-Bills right. game. And he's still a very effective defensive tackle. So those are some tackles that kind of popped out to me. Yeah, uh, just to add a few more. Grover Stewart from the Colts yeah. had a pretty solid year last year. He served, a, I believe, a six-game suspension during in the middle of the season. But when he came back, he was you know, very, very solid. Uh, there are a couple. <laughs> there's one Eagle guy that I always pass on the list. You that can't there's sign Fletcher there's Cox. no chance. No, I know. Can't do it. There is no He's chance. Player, but <laughs> can't do it. You can't do it. Honestly, it would be nice just to get him out of Philly. Yeah, but. yeah right. You just sign him so you have to play against him, right? That's not bad. <laughs> uh, another guy, Javon Kinlaw. I know he hasn't he hasn't performed that well. Uh, he was on he my list. I just up, didn't. I just didn't. I just didn't say he it. hasn't lived up quite to the hype the last couple of years, but. Uh, there's a lot of just pure athletic talent in that guy. And only 26. Only 26. I mean, no. could be worth taking a chance on a guy like that. Th- that's a flyer, right? It's yes. Like, right, here's, oh, for sure. Here's three, four million for a year, and let's see if we can turn you into something. I'm yeah. with you on that. Maurice Hurst is another guy who's always been hurt, still young. If yep. fans remember him, he's the guy that had the heart issue heading into the draft that year. He ended up being drafted, I believe, in the fifth round by the Raiders, if memory serves me correctly. And uh, he's had a lot of injury issues throughout his career. But that's another guy you can kind of take a bit of a flyer on. Yeah, and DJ Reader as well. But I think he's going to be a little too pricey. He's also more of a nose. He's 330. Yeah, I think he, we he, he's we a little repetitive have, with him. Yeah. We already have a pretty good nose tackle. I'm going to skip inside linebacker. One guy that I saw that I liked was Frankie Luvu. I think he's a good player. Maybe if you want, if you need a third linebacker, I just don't think that's a huge need. They have like, two young guys that are on the con- contract and, yeah. and McFadden and O'Karake, so we'll skip over that. Uh, cornerback, I think, is fairly deep too, Matt, to be totally honest with you, and I think it's a, more outside guys than slot guys this particular year, but I like targeting slot players in for agency because they tend to not make as much money, and you can get guys for that a little bit true. less. Uh, he's 30, but he has a long history of being a good player. I like Kenny Moore out of Indianapolis. You know, you plug him in there, you know what you're getting at him. He's a physical player. He's a, He's a a tone setter, I think, on defense. He's a guy I look at. Talk about stealing a guy from the Cowboys. I think Jordan Lewis is a really good slot corner. Dallas has all sorts of cap issues. Yep. Can you steal him away and put him in the slot? I think that would be a good addition. And then the other slot guy I'll throw out there is Miles Bryant. He's a smaller guy from uh, New England that had an okay year last year. He would be more on the low end of slot guys, but I like the Kenny Moore, Jordan Lewis route just because I think they give you a vet you can plug in there. You know what you're getting. They've done it well for a number of years, and I think you can just not worry about that position for a couple of years, which appeals to me a little bit. Yeah. I mean, the top two guys that were set to hit free agency but before getting the franchise tag, Legere Sneed and Jalen Johnson, I think those guys would have been out of the price range yeah, for the Giants anyway. Those guys are going to get paid – if they agree to long-term deals with their respective teams, they're going to make a lot of money. And let's not forget, the Giants, we have Deontay Banks. He's going to go into the season as the number one cornerback. He was the number one cornerback this past year, even with Dory Jackson. Yeah, uh, Deontay Banks was the one that was guarding the number one receiver each and every week. With, Often following them. Yeah, the entire game. So the guy that I believe they're going to bring in to play across from Deontay Banks isn't going to be that, you know, 20 15 20 million dollar a year guy i think they're gonna try to get a veteran a a solid number two that can hold down his side of the field i mean i think back was it two years ago fabian moreau i mean i know that was like an in-season signing but he turned out to be an amazing in-season signing that really played a big role for the defense that year he played well uh that's sort of the the route i see the giants going for the number two corner i do like steven nelson from the Texans. He's a vet. He's a vet. He's 31 years old. Very solid player. Uh, you mentioned Kenny Moore. Keyson Nixon's also interesting. He's just, a slot, yep. Just because he also brings that the uh, return game aspect he does. to the to the team. Other outside, I mean, if you want to spend a little bit less but still get a really good starter, two guys that jump out at me because they're kind of still right in their prime. Uh, Kendall Fuller, who is oh, yeah. Washington corner, who the Giants are familiar with. He's not going to get above 15, I don't think. But he's a good player, and you yeah. plug him in there, he'll give you – he's not a he's not a superstar. He's not going to make a Pro Bowl, but he's a good player. 
And Jadobi Awuzie, another guy who used yes, to be in the division with sure. Dallas, went to Cincinnati. We know how good Cincinnati secondary has been there under Lou Anaruro, former Giants defensive backs coach. Those are two guys, I think, on the higher end in terms of outside corners that I'd be all right. I would be willing to spend, uh, I guess that would be eight figures in free agency per year for, for one of those two guys. Yeah, and I mean, you're going to catch a common theme here, but as we're talking about defensive players, I feel like Sean Murphy bunting is at least gonna, there's going to be rumors about that. I mean, any tight end free agent on the defensive side of the ball, I feel like they're going to be at the very least rumors mm -hmm. connecting them to the Giants. Sean Murphy bunting had a bit of a down year this past season, but the year before was very solid. He could play inside outside too. Yeah, versatility. Another potential flyer type player. I think he'll be 27 when the season starts. Mm -hmm. So not, you know, pretty good age, so yep. Just another guy to keep an eye out for. Uh, Dane Jackson from Buffalo, 27-year-old. Again, the, the Joe Shane connection there. Keep that in mind. And then there are a couple younger guys that were high draft picks that haven't really worked that well that if you want to take a flyer on them, like a Jeffrey Okuda is a free agent. Mm -hmm. Do you want to bet on talent there and see if you can turn him into something? Christian Fulton, another oh, yeah. guy um, from the Titans, I believe. Correct, Christian Fulton, yeah. if I'm mistaken? So another connection younger guy didn't play the best in Tennessee but he's a guy maybe you can get on a, on a pretty good deal if you want to try to develop them to something Rocky Sin, Amik Robertson two other younger guys too if you want and did it come out yesterday the Jaguars cut one of their corners Darius Williams I believe yeah. right yeah I don't know what his contract would be I haven't looked into what his I'm not sure contract either. is but, but yeah it is a name another solid player it's a name and then safety with Javon McKinney you know not being tagged is a position we could talk about here real quick. Uh, Geno Stone is a guy I like. He's only 24 from Baltimore. Comes from yep. a good program in Iowa. He's been kind of the third safety in that group. So I don't think you have to pay him top of market. You can get him for under $10 million a year. Um, I don't know how much he's going to make, but he's not going to be the top of the market if you want to add somebody. And then there's a bunch of free safeties, man. I'm just going to rattle off some names real quick. Jordan Fuller, Jordan Whitehead, Deshaun Elliott, uh, if you like a nickel safety type, C.J. Gardner-Johnson, who's a bit of an instigator, for anybody that's watched him play football. Uh, Taylor Rapp is another young veteran that can that can play safety that's out there. Or do you want to go the vet route? There's a bunch of older guys. Quandre Diggs just got cut. Yep. Kevin Byard got cut. Eddie Jackson from Chicago is a free agent. And Micah Hyde from Buffalo is a free agent as well. So if you're looking for, I think, a stopgap, that would probably be like a one, two-year deal type thing where you plug him in try to help teach the defense and kind of be that calming factor in the middle. Those are some of the uh, veteran older guys that I think could be good players. Yeah, no, very good list of veteran safeties this year, this offseason. Just two more to add. Yeah. Alohi Gilman from the Chargers, coming off a pretty pretty good year. Pretty good in coverage. And then Darnell Savage from the Packers. I like Savage. He's a good player. Both of those guys, 26, maybe 27 by the time the season starts. Pretty young age though for a second contract. Could play well if if this Xavier McKinney signs elsewhere. Could be a pretty solid replacement. Pair the one of those two guys with uh, Jason Pinnock, Dane Belton. I feel like the upside for that group is pretty high. Yeah. So. Huh? All right, let's go through offense quick here, Matt. Uh, yeah. Quarterback, real fast. Uh, the Giants said they're going to add a quarterback this offseason, at least one. It could be free agency. It could be the draft. If they go the free agency route, just so fans know the veterans that are out there, Ryan Tannehill, Gardner Minshew, obviously Tyrod Taylor, who they're familiar with, Jacoby Brissett, Jameis, Jameis Winston's out there, and then Drew Locke. Those are the veterans that I kind of notched off on my list that I think if you're looking for a guy that you can really depend on as a high-level backup, those would be the guys I would put on my list. What about Josh Dobbs? He was so bad when he got to Minnesota last year. But I when, worry he, when about he was that. in Arizona, no, he played well. It was like magic. I know. It's an interesting name. Just an interesting name. I I feel like that would be more of a guy where, if the Giants decided they really want to target a quarterback in the first round of the draft, then maybe even after the draft, if if he's still around, Dobbs could be an interesting veteran addition at that point. Agreed. For like a minimum deal, a lot of these other backup quarterbacks you said they're going to get more than the minimum they're going to get solid backup quarterback money five plus million a year yeah. for those guys so some, but someone like Dobbs is most likely going to get around or at the minimum agreed running backs real quick and again this is a thick thick market here guys oh, yeah. and this is why the running back market to me is the most fascinating thing uh, of this draft of this free agency period not the market in terms of how much they'll get paid though that's part of it it's how quickly do they sign and 
are these guys concerned about being the first guy through the door? So it's like a game of musical chairs, right? There's so many, so many chairs and the chairs of the teams that are willing to pay running backs. And there's probably more running backs than there are chairs in this situation. This offseason, for sure. Probably by two or three chairs. Yeah. So how quickly do these guys try to sign? The top of the market, guys, it's Saquon, Josh Jacobs, Derrick Henry, Tony Pollard, Austin Eckler. Uh, Eckler, I think, is probably on a tier below those other guys just because of his size. He didn't have a great year last year. Um, if you could get him on the cheap, I thought be if you can't bring Saquon back, I'd be okay with that. DeAndre Swift is another guy. And then you have kind of the lower-end guys, Devin Singletary, Zach Moss. Uh, you want power backs, A.J. Dillon, Gus Edwards, Dante Foreman, three big physical backs. Maybe you want to pair one of the physical guys with Eric Gray, who's a smaller guy. You mm-hmm. could do something like that. Do you want to roll the dice on J.K. Dobbins coming off an injury two straight years? That would be the ultimate flyer. You couldn't depend on him, obviously, but if you want to add him and see how it goes, you could do something like that. So a lot, a lot of big names at the running back position. Yeah, a lot of big names, a lot of different types of running backs. Uh, I mean, just that list you just said, this has got to be the the deepest, probably the best free agent class of running backs ever. I mean, these the are NFL. all pro bowlers, and a lot of them are all pros. I mean, the, the top five, the first five guys you said, Saquon, Jacobs, Derrick Henry, Tony Pollard, Austin Eckler. In, in any other given offseason, each of those guys would probably be the top running back available. Just think of your fantasy football draft. Those are yeah. all first-round picks. Yeah. <laughs> They're all first-round picks. And we, again, and we said DeAndre Swift was on a tier below those guys, and he had a solid year. Yeah. Finally given, you know, full not full workhorse, but the most carries he's gotten in his career, and he held steady and was pr- pretty solid. And we're not even yeah. talking about him in the top five. Yep. Not all that impressed, Matt, to be honest with the wide receiver class. Uh, I just don't think it's a great class. These guys don't tend to reach free agency. If teams really like them, they'll sign them. If they can't afford them, they'll trade them. So a lot of times these guys don't even make it to free agency. Mm-hmm. I still think Calvin Ridley has it to be a number one wide receiver in him. I think he's a really good player. He's interesting, though, in terms of the contract and the past and the history, yep. what teams decide to do with him. And then you got a bunch of role players, Gabe Davis, Darnell Mooney, Kendrick Bourne, who's coming off an ACL, K.J. Osborne. But to me, and I don't see the Giants going to the top of the market to sign a guy like Ridley. I just don't think that's something they're going to do, given how deep the draft is at that position. The Giants have a bunch of guys that are like Davis and Mooney and Bourne and Osborne. I don't need to add another one of those guys, right? Hyatt's here. Robinson's here. Darius Slayton's still in their contract. Those guys are fine in that category. If I'm going to add somebody, I'm going to add a guy that I think could become a number one, which tells me that's why I still think drafting a wide receiver is going to be eventually where they wind up. I do not expect him to be super busy at wide receiver in free agency. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, this offseason was primed to be a great wide receiver class, but then Mike Evans got extended earlier in the week, and then T. Higgins and Michael Pittman both got the franchise tag, and those were the top three wide receivers that were set to hit the market. Like I said, they usually don't make it. Exactly. Uh, I mean, Hollywood Brown, Marquise Brown is... Too much of a Jalen Hyatt type. I think it's, yeah. very, I think it's very repetitive in terms of skill I mean, set, you know? I agree. I don't think he's a great fit for the current Giants roster, but he's probably up there with Ridley as the top wide receivers now available. Agreed. The one guy that is interesting to me, and he's shown flashes of, I don't know about being that rock-solid number one receiver, but Curtis Samuel... Curtis Samuel, over the last couple of years, has just shown flashes of being a great wide receiver, used in a variety of different ways. Just with how creative Brian Dable and Mike Kafka tend to get or like to get on offense, depending on the contract that he's looking for, that is the one guy that I would be, if the price is right, interested in bringing in and adding to the fold. A little duplicative to Wanda Robinson for me in terms of how you want to use him in the slot, yeah. use him as a gadget guy, hand the ball off to him, use him on screens, things like that. You know, to me, it would almost be replaying the Paris Campbell experiment, right? Similar um, type of players. Yeah. And I'm just not sure you're going to be able to get him on the field because you want Wanda Robinson out there as much as you can, right? True. So I'm just, I, I agree. Good player. Right. I think he'll be a good signing for somebody. Not sure with Wandell here, that's necessarily a fit, but good player. And uh, I'm, you're right. They would, they would find a way to use him if yeah. he got here and he'd be a good player. Tight ends, again, real quick. Noah Fant, Hunter Henry, Gerald Everett, Jonu Smith. Those are kind of the four guys that I picked out that I thought were pretty good. Dalton Schultz just signed that three-year contract extension. And then, you know, Mike Kosicki, if that gets you excited. But it's just not a great list. I know there's some questions about Darren Waller and what's going to happen. All in, you know, There's no indication he's not going to be here. So I think we act as always going to be here until we hear otherwise. So with 
obviously they're the tight ends they have in the roster. I just don't think this is going to be a spot that they attack in free agency either, to be honest with you. No, I don't think so either. If they do, just uh, Gerald Everett, pretty uh, somewhat interesting of a player. Yeah, I agree. But again, nothing, no like absolute game changers in this tight end free agent class. Agreed. All right, offensive lineman, and then we'll get to your calls here, 201-939-4513. We actually went through this faster than I thought. Um, three guys to me are at the top of this list, which means these guys are going to make 15 or more million dollars. Right? You're starting outside? I'm tackle? Everyone, the one everyone? Okay. Yeah. Because one guy can do both. So that's why I want to combine them. Fair enough. So the three guys at the top here I'm looking at, two straight-up guards in Dotson and Robert Hunt, right? And then Michael and Wenyu from New England, who could play right guard and right tackle, which considering all the discussions about Evan Neal, having that flexibility might be useful. Those guys are all going to be 15 million plus a year players, in my opinion. And yep. honestly, I'm cool with that. Like at this point, I, I want to get a veteran right guard in between Evan Neal and John Michael Schmitz. If you can eventually bump out the right tackle, if Neal doesn't work out like on Wenyu, even better. So that would be the guy I would circle and put my stars around for the guy that would interest me. Um, I don't know what the Giants front office is saying. There's a bunch of other good guys we'll get to in a second. But if you want to go top of the market and all those guys are 26 or 27 years old, these are young veterans that are in their prime, that's where you would go if, if, if you're looking for a guy that can slide into that right guard spot um, at the top of the market. Yeah, I'm with you completely. I mean, given the Giants obviously have several positions that need to be addressed on both sides of the ball, if it were me, I feel like the interior offensive line might – be at the very top of my priority list. Top of mind. Especially considering how many good guards there are, good young guards there are this offseason. I feel like that is the position where that and edge rusher were the, are the two positions that I feel like I would personally would be most willing to pay that, you know, 15 plus million a year. Um, and I might even consider doing both. Yeah, if if they can make it work under the cap, and you can I would definitely the be the contracts both. where maybe the first year number isn't as big. I would I would be amenable to that. Yeah, and that's why I think it was big that yesterday the Patriots put the transition tag on Kyle Duggar because that meant Onuanu was going to hit free agency. Yeah. I mean, unless they agree to a deal by Monday. But it sounds like he's going to hit free agency, which that could be big for the Giants because, as you said, could play guard and tackle. And given the Giants' current situation, that could come in handy in a big way. Um yeah, you want to get to the, the other guys? Yeah, real before? quick. Um, I think the next group of guards, Matt, that I think are in that medium price range would be Damian Lewis from Seattle and Jonah Jackson from Detroit. Yep. Uh, two good players, both 27. Lewis is more of a mauler. Jonah Jackson is also a, a, a good run blocker. Uh, you go to the next group down, you get into the Dalton or Reisner and Ezra Cleveland area. I think you're under $10 million a year for those guys. Uh, again, 28 is Reisner, 25 is Ezra Cleveland. Both guys have been a little up and down, so I don't think you're getting you know, rock-solid, really good starters, but they're guys I think they're are upgrades and they're younger. You could work them a little bit. And then, you know, Greg Van Roten, just because he was with Las Vegas last year with Carmen Basillo, the Giants offensive line coach, but he's 34. He's a guard, played well. Uh, John Simpson from Baltimore is just 26. I just don't think he's as good as the other players that I mentioned. Graham Glasgow, again, from Detroit, a guy that coming from a good offensive line, I like adding those guys. So he's 31, not as big of a fan. I like the other guys I mentioned better. And then real quick, a tackle. There are some swing tackles up there that I like. Jermaine Illuminor from Las Vegas, had a couple good years there. Again, under yep. Carmen Brasillo, he's just 28, 29? What do I have written down there? I think 29. That, I think that's a nine. Yeah. Um, and then George Fant, not to be confused with Noah Fant, who's been a right tackle in this league for a long time. Solid backup. He can swing both sides. Uh, Cameron Fleming, once a giant, always a giant. <laughs> he's a guy that can play both spots. He's still out there as a swing tackle. And then uh, Chakuma or Okorafor from Pittsburgh is another guy that, that's kind of played tackle a little bit that I thought could be a little bit of a swing. So those are some of the names that kind of jumped out to me. Yeah. No, I mean, some of those guys, I think, will probably be on the the free the wish list, the guys that Giants will be interested in. Um, Josh Jones, maybe, if they want to add a tackle. I know he had a, a somewhat of a down year this past year, but the year before was very solid. Uh, Graham Glasgow. Maybe if they again, he's a little bit on the older side. I feel like if they're going to sign a guard to medium to big money, they're going to want to sign someone on the younger side that can be around for the long term, potentially, you know, multiple years, not just someone that's stopgap solution. Agreed. 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, a lot of good players, man. A lot, lot of good players, especially on the interior where the Giants might have both interior guard positions they're looking to fill. Hey, the two starters to end last season, both are free agents, Justin yeah. Pugh and Ben Bredesen. So, and I don't think anyone's willing to just hand the job over to Marcus McKeithen or Josh Azudu. So, no, I don't think so. They can compete. They'll be there, but I don't think it's like, here's the starting job and go run with it. So I'm with you, and I think that's something to keep an eye on here um, as we move forward. All right, 201-939-4513, 201-939-4513. We'll take your questions on free agency, the draft, whatever you want to touch on. We'll do all that. Uh, If you're still looking for a lot of draft talk, guys, uh, just go check out draft season. Uh, The episode this week, which is our combine review on offense, is going to go up later this afternoon. Uh, so check that out. But in the meantime, uh, check out the most recent Giants Huddle podcast. Dave Syvertson, uh, he'll, he's with us. He's from Our Lads. He's our main scout. Um, we go over an hour just going over everything that happened at the Combine. Dom had to edit that thing. I appreciate that, Dom. It was very long. We kept going. But it was a really good conversation. And really, some really good J.J. McCarthy talk at the end that was really fascinating. So go check that out on the Giants Huddle podcast. You can find it at Giants.com slash podcast or your favorite podcast platform. Just search for Giants Huddle. And just FYI, Google Podcast is closing down. It's shutting down in two months. So feel free. Uh, They're migrating all their stuff over to YouTube Music, which is a thing, apparently. I was not aware (laughs) of it was a thing until I got my notice from Google Podcasts that the service was shutting down. Uh, So you can find all our podcasts on uh, YouTube Music if you want to go there. There's a little podcast tab at the top. You can just type on it and search for the podcast. You can also export uh, your subscriptions from uh, Google Podcasts into YouTube Music. So... Make sure you go and do all of that. All right, 201-939-4513. Let's go to Wilson and Roxbury. He'll lead us off today. Hi, Wilson. Hey, Johnny. Hey, Matt, man. You're settling in really good, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, listen, you survived my phone calls without drinking Pepto Bismol. You made it. <laughs> I think you need something stronger than Pepto, Wilson. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> right. Yeah, why do you want to say that in the air, Johnny? Hey, uh, <laughs> Hey, hey, listen, uh, uh, real quick, uh, uh, on Saquon and on the, on the, on the six overall pick. Uh, as, as, on Saquon, Johnny, as much as I love him and Giants fan love him, uh, I, it's time to move on. It's time to turn the page. Um, you know, uh, I know he's a great guy, great locker room guy, extremely high character guy, but, you know, I've seen for uh, five, six years already. I don't know how long, how long he's been here, six years? Six years. Six years, uh, yeah. Uh, six, I, I've seen too many. The 40-yard runs, and then uh, the next three runs, and uh, he loses five yards behind the line. So uh, it's, it'll be good for, good for him. It'll be good for the Giants. Um, I don't know. If you're going to spend seven, eight million dollars, I want I I want a, I want somebody maybe like, uh, I don't know, like Derrick Henry. I want somebody that when it's third and one, I have a 70% chance of making the third and one. You know, I want somebody that, that if he hit, gets hit behind the line, Somehow falls forward and gets the yard. I just think it's time, Johnny. I don't know what hey, you think. Hey, look, Wilson, I hear you. And look, I see it both ways, right? And I think Matt okay. does as well. If he comes back, great. If he get, It has to be at the right number, considering he's a right. running back. And Joe Shane right. made that point pretty clear at the combine. The yep. running back market's going to dictate this. If he's back, great. If he's yeah. not, does it hurt your offense? Yeah, he was their best offensive player last year. You get to figure yeah, out how to but, replace him. But again, you have the extra money in free agency. Right. If you improve the offensive line enough, you can put right. it back that's not maybe quite as talented behind it and have identical, if not better, results if you get better blocking. So, I, right. so Wilson, I totally get where you're coming from. Yeah, especially right. with how many, again, how many running backs are set to hit the market, how many talented right. running backs, 100%. All right. And uh, on, the, on, the, on the draft, especially on the six overall pick, uh, listen, if Joe Shane picks J.J. McCarthy with the six overall pick, forget about being fired. He should be in jail. I mean, it, I mean, come on. Man. I mean, this, these are the same guys, the same people that are talking about J.J. McCarthy, Johnny, and Matt are the same people that have Malik Willis going in the top 10 a couple, couple of years ago. I don't think I it's mean, that crazy. I don't think it's that crazy, Wilson. I, you know, Malik Willis ended up being a day three pick. And, you know, he yeah, has, right. and, 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 and look, J.J. McCarthy has had a lot of success in college. I think he's a much better well, college quarterback. Than I understand, Johnny. But, but Johnny, you, when you play at Michigan, it's like, it's, like, it's like when you play in Georgia. I mean, the quarterbacks in Georgia look like, uh, you know, Joe Montana. And look what happened to, what was, remember that guy, uh, 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 what, I forgot the guy's name, that won like two, uh, two national championships in a row and he ended up with the Chargers. He wasn't even drafted. All I'm saying is this, look, I said this to you a million times. I think we have a franchise quarterback in Daniel Jones. I think drafting a quarterback is a mistake. If they somehow decide that Daniel Jones is not our guy, 
then it tells me two things. It tells me that the Daniel Jones contract was John Maris doing. I, I know you said it wasn't, but fans like myself, that's what we're going to get out of it. And then we that, that's a problem in its own. But if it's not. Yeah, but if it, but if it was John Maris doing, and again, this right. is, I, I, I'm just going to indulge. I know you said, no, I no, know no, you listen, let me just finish. I'm going to indulge right. in the conspiracy theory for the second, even though it's nonsense. If it was John Maris doing, would he then let him then move on from Daniel Jones this year? You know what well, I'm saying? Because, so if he's controlling everything well, no, and he's no. the mastermind, master, but, puppet well, master, well, why would they let Johnny, him do it this year? No, be, okay, well, Johnny, I, I don't. But then, then why? Then, then you can't draft a quarterback with the six overall pick, Johnny. Then, and if you do, and if you, if, and if they do, listen, if they change, okay, forget about that. Let's say they change their mind and they say, you know what? Maybe we made a mistake. Whatever we don't, and we're gonna draft a quarterback with the six overall pick. That's fine. I think it's a mistake, but that's fine. But they, then you got to ship. Daniel Jones to the Raiders for like a fourth round pick because you cannot have both of them on the roster. It's just not this is not 2018 when Jordan Love was behind Aaron Rodgers. You pick a quarterback with the six overall pick, he's got to start right away. You got to pray to God that he's the right guy. Otherwise, you won't be here anyway. And that's it. You can because I'm gonna get, play a little game with me real quick. Yeah. Let's say you pick a quarterback with the six overall pick, and I, the other day you said that you didn't have a problem with that quarterback sitting down, right? Okay. For, for I, 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 part I'll, I'll go, of the season, not for the whole season, uh, okay, and not for multiple years, but for part of the season, uh, okay. I have no problem with it. That's fine. Okay, but listen to me. Play with me real quick. Let's just say Daniel Jones balls out, and I'm going to live a little, and I'm going to say he goes 11-6, and six, and he makes it to the NFC Championship. Not the Super Bowl, because I'm not going to go crazy. Okay. The NFC Championship. What do you do the next year, Johnny? That's, what a, do great, you do? that's a great problem to have. Wilson. <laughs> Wilson. <laughs> Johnny, you can't. What? Okay, go ahead, Matt. I'm sorry, Matt. Go ahead. With that exact scenario, we literally saw that the last couple of years in Green Bay, where they drafted Jordan Love and Aaron Rodgers went and won back-to-back MVP but, awards. But, yeah, yeah. But and then when Matt, Jordan Matt, Love, when Jordan Love Matt, finally started, he had a great rookie year. Now the Packers okay. are thrilled that they did that. Matt, listen, that happens once, once, and probably a thousand. And, and, and in NFL you gave years, this a scenario, Wilson. That was your scenario. <laughs> Don't blame us for the but scenario. That, but, 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 it, but, this is, but you can't, Johnny, but that's like 100 years ago in NFL years. You, you cannot do, but you can't, but you cannot go, you cannot go on, in a season thinking like that. I mean, that doesn't happen that often. I mean, I'm just saying that the sixth overall pick has got to be an impact player one way or the other. That's what I'm saying, Johnny. You cannot just, Take a, a quarterback and have him sit for a year because you know what's well, okay. For, and then what happens if Daniel Jones starts and he throws the first interception in Giant Stadium? The whole stadium's gonna go crazy. No, so that, it, that'll it, happen. You're right about that. That'll happen. You, you have to have then, self discipline and you have to be patient. You have to do what you think is best for your team, the players, and the organization. And you have to let right, the but, craziness of the fans wash over you and you can't let it affect your decision making. But, it ha- but but eventually, Johnny, listen, this is New York. You, you know that the fans affect a lot of what everybody does here. All I'm saying is... Joe Shane's stubborn, man. He, he said it uh, himself. Right, Joe, right, Joe Shane and Brian Dable are right, stubborn dudes, and I, I think in a good way. All right, listen, uh, uh, before I get off real quick, yes. I just want to ask you you and Matt, because uh, I don't want to talk about draft anymore, because it, 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 it's a crap shoot anyway. But let me ask you, right now, Johnny, today, yes, the sixth overall pick, and you too, Matt, who are the Giants picking? I think they, if I had to guess right now, and all it is is a guess, I would say they'd walk away with either Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors. I would say the That's same. Great news. Same exact what thing. What about you? Same well, who, thing. Who's that, Matt? I, I would have Sorry. said the same thing. One of those two receivers. All right, all right good, good. So then, so then we'll give. And, and listen, and I don't mind a quarterback in the second round because the second round pick is it, it is what it is. I mean, it, it, you, if you're lucky, you hit it. If not, it doesn't kill you. But all right, good. All right. So I think so too. I think uh, I'm thinking either that or, or an offensive lineman. No defense, no defense, no pass rush or none of that. Because I know you don't like me saying this, Johnny, but I, I think I think Evan Neal and uh, and uh, and Kevin Thibodeau to me w- were not good picks. I said that to Paul the other day. He almost wanted to reach to the television and strangle me, but that's what I. Think. Sounds right. I li- I listen, <laughs> thanks, thanks, guys. All right, thanks, thank guys. you, Wilson. Appreciate it. That doesn't surprise me. I think Paul would reach you the phone and strangle you a little bit. That's not surprising. Definitely would try, at least. <laughs> Look, Wilson, I, I get where you're coming from with, with the quarterback at six, and the question the Giants have to ask themselves is whoever that quarterback is, is he that much of an upgrade over Daniel? 
where they think it's make work and worth making the pick or trading up for the pick. That's a decision you have to make. Is it enough of an upgrade that you want to make that decision? Because if you don't think from a talent standpoint is that much of an upgrade, you don't do it. No, of course not. But the one thing that Wilson seemed to harp in on that I just want to touch on, I feel like if you quizzed all 32 or pulled all 32 general managers and said you could draft a quarter a rookie quarterback in the first round and have him sit for a full year while still getting solid quarterback solid to good quarterback play from whoever is starting i feel like most gms would sign up for that in a heartbeat like i feel like the ideal scenario is to let the rookie kind of get the feel of the nfl while not having the pressure of being the starting quarterback until he's got a little more experience and you know seeing the speed of the game getting all the practices in i agree with that i feel like they'd prefer maybe not a full season as you said but i feel like at least like half a season if you're still getting good quarterback play from whoever is starting i feel like most if not all gms would sign up for that yeah and i don't think joe shane would oh joe shane has said that daniel Daniel jones is gonna be if he's healthy he's gonna be the starter week one yes he's said that directly very clearly it just is and that doesn't mean if they draft a quarterback high that guy's not going to be the starter by the end of the year we don't know the answer to that question obviously but guys it it, remember no one's winning a super bowl in a rookie quarterback's rookie year cj stroud is literally the best rookie quarterback in the history of the sport i'm not that that's not hyperbole the best rookie season for any quarterback in the history of the sport Maybe Robert Griffin III is a close second when he had his unbelievable, but that was more running than it was throwing. Yeah. And they got to what, the second round of the playoffs? So, guys, the, the rookie of their quarterback is a learning developmental year anyway. Especially if you're talking about J.J. McCarthy specifically, he's a guy that's going to take some time now. Yeah, he just, just turned 21. In Michigan. Just turned 21 years old a month ago. Correct. All right, back to the calls, 201-939-4513. Let's go to Hugo in New Jersey. Hugo, what's up? Hey, good afternoon, guys. What's um, up? Well, l- let me let me start by uh, harping back to my off-season plan, which was get this team more physical and get it tougher. And uh, I think the first smart move is not paying top of the market for a running back and safety. And based on the rumors out there, two of the three components of my off-season plan are in the works in signing guards, edge, and, and I'll continue to say three techniques. Would love to have Christian Wilkins. And, John, I know you keep saying you're going to have two guys making more than $20 million, but that's exactly what we had uh, last year after uh, Dexter's contract was done because they had Leonard Williams and and, uh, and Dexter. Well, yeah, yeah. Eventually. He, yeah, but Dexter's contract hadn't kicked in yet. Uh, uh, co- correct. C- correct. But, I mean, that is sort of a – I think a formula for success, right? If you allocate your resources correctly, but anyhow, I'll, I'll leave that aside for now. Um, would you want to bring back Leonard Williams? Is that something that would interest you? No, no, no. I, I, I would. I want to get um, a, a younger. I, I know. I know Leonard's only twenty nine, but he has a lot of miles. And believe it, Christian he's Wilkins, I think is. I think he's, he might be twenty eight. He actually was an older player coming out of wrote his age down here. Yeah. Christian Wilkins is twenty eight. Just a year yeah, and a half he, younger than Leonard, which is crazy. Yeah, but he has less mileage. No, and that's by the true. Way, I, think, I just, I, I just think he's a better player. Um, I think anyhow, close um, to be honest with you, but okay. Okay, uh, off of the combine. So uh, I guess I'm in the Malik neighbors camp because I value separation more than size. Yep. But I think e- either player would be would be just fine. And plus, I think Malik neighbors gives you more inside outside versatility, which I also value. Um, players that are sort of second through fourth round players that, and, and by the way, just just a side note, Troy Fotano, boy, that guy, whew, he was super, super. Yeah, and Hugo, I said this on, on on the two draft podcasts I mentioned. That dude's not a guard. That dude is a starting offensive tackle. With the way he worked out in his thirty four and a half inch arms, yeah. I don't want to hear people talking about him as a guard anymore. That guy's a tackle. Yeah, I think they look at the under six five height, but the arms. Is, is, is the, the point, and the feet are amazing. I'd rather so, have a uh, shorter guy with longer arms. You get better leverage. Better leverage. Yeah, better leverage. Yep. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So, so here's some. Here's a few other guys that are kind of second or fourth round guys that caught my eye. Uh, Cooper Beebe, the guard. Um, He'll be a second Melton. rounder. Good player like him. Yeah. 
Melton, the corner from Rutgers. Like him, too. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a potential slot. I think third round there and, for him. And and I'm a big fan of Blake Corum. I, I know you're not as much, John, but he actually tested pretty well. And the thing I like about Blake Corum uh, is he has crazy contact balance. Yep. Well, three things. He has vision, spatial awareness, contact balance, and toughness. Yeah, and I want to get I want to get Matt's comment here on Corum too because I don't think I've heard I don't think we've talked about Blake Corum before, and I was really concerned about his athletic profile as Hugo mentioned heading into the combine. He sold me. I thought he was super impressive. I thought his body type was fine. His four five three, I think he ran in the forty I yard. Think four five one. Four five. What, what, one okay, even one. better. That's more than yeah. good enough for his running style. His short shuttle and three cone were off the charts, which is what we expected. I'm I, I am yep. exactly Hugo and, and I'm fine with Blake Corum. If he's your number one running back in the class, I'm totally okay with that. Matt, what are your thoughts on Corum? Yeah, I, I think Corum's very solid prospect. Uh personally, I, I I just my personal preference, I like slightly bigger running backs. But Trey Benson more your tight? Yeah. But I mean the results he had the results at Michigan. You can't argue with what he with what he did. What was he two oh nine at five eight? Is that what he weighed in at the cup? Uh two oh five. Two oh five. At five five eight, two oh five. You're actually I mean, pretty stocky. That, that's very stocky. Very stocky. Yeah. And look, yeah, he, he, he he performed well at the combine. He did. He he's a very solid very solid prospect. Probably go what somewhere day two. Yeah, I, I would say end the round two, top round three. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say middle of day two. Yeah, but you think uh, you think you think round three. The, the thing the thing I worry about is you got to fight off the Chargers and somebody. You know, and they're well, picking the, ahead of you us. Know, the good I thing really the good think. thing though is that there are a lot of running backs. Like there are like six to eight third round running backs in my opinion that you can choose from. So I, I'm not going to get picky there. Whichever one's there that I like, I'm just going to pick them. I'm good with that. I don't know where he's going to go in the draft, but the Louisville. Running back Isaac Garendo. Garendo. I have not watched any of his tapes. Oh so. boy! But what he did at the combine That's last crazy. week. Oh my it's god! Ridiculous. That sort of athleticism you don't see at very. Two hundred twenty pounds, by the yeah. way. Yeah, six feet two twenty one, and runs a four three three. Yeah, it's pretty good. Forty one and a half inch vertical jump. It's, oh it's funny that he's a former <laughs> Wisconsin Badger, and it's not surprising when you see his size that he was a former Badger. Yeah. Hugo, final point. Yeah, uh, John, we have three guys that uh, create a lot of hand-wringing, right? Evan Neal, uh, I think Sean O'Hara has been actually pretty objective in his evaluation of Evan Neal, Darren Waller, we know injury, and then Daniel Jones. And let's put the injuries aside. Uh, I, I think I mentioned to you once before that I worry about the mental damage that's been done to him. But I also hear a bunch of criticisms of Daniel Jones from people who I think are relatively objective, and I don't know if it's true or not, because that has me worried as well. So, so what am I hearing? He, he's slow to process. He doesn't throw to the field side. He doesn't throw outside the numbers. He doesn't take the whole shots. He doesn't have pocket awareness. He doesn't throw people open. He doesn't anticipate. These, are these things made up? I mean, I would love... I know a guy like Orlovsky is a little bit biased against Jones, but I'd like to hear from a quarterback expert on how Daniel Jones plays the game when he has time and open receivers. Well, that hasn't really happened very often. So there isn't a whole lot of tape on that, Hugo, to be totally honest with you. And I appreciate the call. And the problem, and I'm almost giving up on doing it just because I think it's hard from our perspective, Matt, to determine how well a quarterback processes just from watching them without knowing what the play is, what their design progression yep. is. Now, former quarterbacks have a much better chance of doing that. Yes, right? for sure. But like, I don't know if you saw Kurt Warner tweeting about evaluating college quarterbacks last mm-hmm. week. Even he's like, guys, I, I, I don't know how they're processing. I don't know what they're being asked to do. This is a freaking Hall of Fame quarterback. Yeah. So am I arrogant enough where I'm going to try to determine whether or not a guy can process by watching them without knowing what they're being taught in the meeting room? I, I'm just not willing to go there. I can go by results and, and what I see. I mean, is is Daniel Jones Joe Burrow from a processing perspective? Probably not. Few are. That's why Joe Burrow is Joe Burrow, right? But Hugo, to, to answer your question, I don't know the answer to that. I, I I'm not a good enough evaluator to to be able to tell you the answer to that question. I feel the same exact way. I forgot who it was, but there was some you know reputable NFL reporter or analyst that yesterday, on maybe it was on ESPN one of one of the segments, said that. He doesn't think Caleb Williams should start at all his rookie season. That he should take a full year 
sitting behind the bench because he doesn't think that Caleb Williams' game is going to translate well to the NFL. And I only bring this up because Caleb Williams is the number one pick, the consensus number one pick, the consensus top player in the draft. And even he has guys out there, draft analysts that are paid to, you know, critique or analyze prospects, analyze NFL players. And even he doesn't think that Caleb Williams will be ready to play as a rookie. And that's a guy that everyone seems to be on the same page about across the NFL media landscape. So point just being is I'm with you 100 percent that I I don't know enough about what Daniel Jones is learning, what he's being told to do, what the playbook says to be able to say, like, he's doing X, Y and Z well and ABC poorly. Right. In in terms of the stuff that's happening, the meetings and processing, it's just too hard. Like we can see if he misses a throw. We can see if he holds the ball too long and gets sad. Like, that's the stuff we can see, right? There's other stuff that I think is just really hard for us to make that judgment. And by the way, I was looking at this the other day, and actually, you know what? I can't get into this now because we got two more calls we got to take, and I have a meeting at 1.30. But I know people said Daniel Jones was, like, terrible to start the year. He played three bad games. Yeah. So you made a decision over a five-year body of work, and you played three bad games. Four if you count the Seattle game, which, by the way, he actually played well in that game except for that one pick at the goal line, which was terrible. But otherwise, 27 to 34, not a terrible game. The two interceptions were bad. But he played well against Arizona. Obviously, Dallas was not good. The Niners were not good. But again, that's two really good defenses, and he was under pressure. And then he played barely half a game against Miami, and he barely played half a game against the Raiders. So you don't even have full games to judge on those two. You want to put them together and count those as one game because it's kind of two halves? Fine, we can we can play that game. So you look at, what, four bad games then? And even the first two that you mentioned, the Cowboys game, obviously – was bad all around but it was pouring rain against one of the best defenses in the nfl who jumped out to an early lead and just from playing from behind against that team in those circumstances that was going to be tough for any quarterback and then and then the niners again one of the best defenses made it all the way to the super bowl no saquon no andrew thomas yeah so i'm with you and he got sacked 10 times against seattle 10 i remember that was 10 that was something (laughs) (laughs) and again we're not telling you something that, you know, we're not trying to tell you he had this great year and he was fantastic, but you just have to understand the circumstances here. And when you make that sort of decision and a commitment on a player, I think it's hard for, you know, three or four games to completely flip people's mind on it. So like I said yesterday, Paul Schwartz said this on our show at the combine. I think it was accurate. The Giants, would they always be looking for uh, an upgrade at any position? Sure, but are they desperate for a quarterback? I don't think I would turn them as being desperate. Yeah. I, they aren't I the Falcons. The same way. They aren't the Raiders. Yeah. Right? Where they have no one in the building where they think can start. It's it's a different situation. Yep. I know fans don't want to hear that. But, again, I'm a guy that's open to it. I've been talking. If you listen to our draft coverage, guys, talk about quarterbacks with all the guys we have on. I'm open to the to, to the idea. But that's just kind of how I feel about it. Anyway. All right. We got two more calls. We got to squeeze in. Randy in California. And then James will take you last. Randy, what's going on? Hey, buddy. I'm trying, to, I'm not, trying not to take too much time, so I'll make it kind of quick. That way you can get to your meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Um, hey, uh, my question is, is there a guard or a tackle out there you'd try to go out and get in free agency and fix the off- offensive line? Because it doesn't matter what receiver you get or quarterback you get, you're going to be running for your life anyway. Yeah, and I so think... Unless I, you can I, I, solidify, solidify that line, what is this all for? We need to get the best guard and tackle we can get and try to fix this thing. Otherwise, we're going nowhere again. Yeah, and man, anyway, I think... I'll let you go, and you have a good day, brother. Appreciate Thank you, Randy. Appreciate Thanks, you coming Randy. all the way from California. It sounds like he's on his way to work, maybe. It's a little early. 9.30 there? 10, 10.30. He's 30. probably at work already by now. But um, we look, we mentioned him, uh, Michael and Wendy from New England. It's a guy that can play right tackle, right guard. I think he gives you uh, insurance with Evan Neal, and he gives you a guy that you can plug in a right tackle and start right away. Yeah. I mean, we had the whole list uh, also just of pure guards because, yeah. again, looks like the Giants probably will need to add two starting caliber guards whether it's free agency or the draft we went through the whole list before but there is a very good deep crop of free agent guards this offseason and remember these guys can all extend still between now and the start of free agency with That's their true. team so some of you guys might not end up hitting free agency there's still four days for that to happen yep so something to keep in mind and again uh the negotiating process begins noon on monday and then the league year is four o'clock on wednesday yes. so that's and that's when these officials uh signings can become official james and georgia will wrap us up james what's going on hey what's going on guys um, i had a couple but i'll save it for the two that i should have got to yesterday what y'all talking about rumors that you heard at the combine one thing that was floating around by a reputable source 
you know, Rich Eisen, who most people would say is reputable. A clip is out there that said he heard the Giants have buyer's remorse, this and that. That's why they're looking into a quarterback. And again, that was you know, that was something he said, James, was a rumor, yes. not something he was reporting. Exactly very, what very I was going to say. Right. That clip, right, right, that right, clip right. has gone. Yeah. That clip has gone viral, but everyone seems to be forgetting. Yeah. He he prefaced the whole segment by calling it by, rumors, this is, not reports. This is the scuttle. This is the scuttlebutt that we heard at the combine, right. and, and it was one of the most. You know, you could take it with a grain of salt, but I think uh, sometimes people are like, well, these reporters and things like that aren't just saying things just to, you know. I don't know. Get the get the ball rolling. And you know again, what I mean? James, I, I talked to a bunch of people out there too. Um, people told me the Giants were open to a quarterback, much like we've been saying here. Uh, no one has expressed it quite as vehemently, in private, even as Rich Eisen described on his show. That's right, all right, I can right. tell you. And uh, my my last thing is, y'all had great coverage. Um, and uh, uh, one thing that good critique about was that the coaches weren't at the combine, and I just feel like. Joe Shane, you know, you can give him your, your shopping list. He go buy the groceries, and you make the, you know, Brian Debo makes the dinner when he gets back is the kind of relationship they had going on at the Combine. I mean, Giants, wanna, no, James, uh, Giants, Giants, coaches, Giants coaches were there. <laughs> Brian Dable, uh, Brian so Dable was... A, so just a, Dable so was just there. A, I mean, I know it was there, but was it just like they didn't like how he they weren't available to the media? Yeah, That's yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Brian Dable uh, didn't d- didn't do a press conference, but him and the entire coaching staff were out there. Yeah, I know they were there. Uh, did they stay the whole time? or? I mean, they were showing they Dable on TV on Sunday during the offensive line drill, so yeah. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Well, well then, yeah, I guess the critique about them just not, you know, talking to the media and leaving it up to Joe Shane is, you know, like, he, he's here to do the, the shopping. You'll see what we do with him when we, you know, he knows who we like. We'll let you talk to, you know, Joe Shane, I guess. And the owner meetings – yeah, go ahead, James. Finish up real quick. Well, uh, the I'm just going to – is it impossible to think that if Barkley doesn't get the number he he wants, he can retire, hold out, or sit out? Is that not an option? You know what I mean? No, is, I would is, say that's not an option. He will sign a contract so, to play football next year. Yeah. So, Bar- so Barkley, so Barkley doesn't have an option to retire if he if they offer him nine million dollars. I mean, he can he, he, he can choose to retire. I just, I mean, right, it, right, right. It, well, that's it, all, that's yeah, it was an option. But if you know Saquon Barkley, he's not done playing football. Yeah. Thank you, James. Appreciate the call, my friend. And look, owners' meetings are what two weeks, I three weeks? So. Yeah, couple it's weeks. in March, right? Yeah. Ryan Dave was going to talk there, so you'll get plenty of. Stuff from Dave's when he talks at the owners' meeting. Yeah, this is also this is Joe's time. This yeah. is his time of year, just like during the season is Dave's time. So, Dave's did pull me over and say, "I wish I had a chance to talk to Charlie in Portland, Maine, over the course of the time <laughs> of the combine." I'm just, he didn't actually do that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, thanks for joining us on Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the football giants. Uh, for Matt, for thank you to all our callers. Uh, don't forget, Giants season tickets, Giants.com slash tickets. You can get your 2024 season tickets. And the Giants TV is our official streaming app. Make sure you go check that out. Everybody, thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time on Big Blue Kickoff Live.